Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, the Booker, Berlin and Buster Keaton. We speak to writer Maria Stepanova and translator Sasha Dugdale on making the shortlist for the International Booker Prize. Then, Germany's art scene makes an in-person appearance with Gallery Weekend Berlin. And we remember one of the great comedians of Hollywood's golden era. The Literary Prize that celebrates translated fiction, the International Booker, has announced its six shortlisted titles. Among them is Maria Stepanova's family memoir in which she dips her toes in various forms and genres. In Memory of Memory starts with the death of an aunt and the family photos and diaries she left behind. While bringing her family's story alive, Stepanova also tells the story of historical and cultural changes that happened in Russia over the last century. Well, we're now joined by Maria Stepanova and the translator of her book, Sasha Dagdell. Hi there both, it's lovely to have you with us on Showcase today. I really appreciate your time. So Maria, congratulations on being the, short, on being the shortlist, I mean both of you, of course. Uh, what does it mean to you being in the list? Was it a surprise, Maria? Yes, of course, uh, it was. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it still is a huge surprise. And, uh, well, I'm stunned, I'm humbled, I'm honored. And uh, I'm tremendously glad, not only for uh, our work, but for myself, for Sasha, for the recognition our work is gaining, but mostly for the genre itself, because the, uh, this special kind of writing that is based uh, beneath the borders of conventional fiction, something that not exactly a novel, that not exactly a memoir, not exactly fiction, not exactly non-fiction, something that is uh, a bit hard to put your finger on. That the fact that it is getting noticed nowadays, that is a, an important thing. That's exactly why I asked whether it was a surprise for you, because we're not really used to seeing this sort of you know, I would call it almost experimental sort of writing in these kind of lists. So, you know, in that sense, congratulations again, because that was a brave thing for you to do, I guess. And Sasha, uh, congratulations to you as well. I wonder, you know, what kind of a process was it for you translating this book? Because I know you are close friends with Maria. So, you know, how is it working with your close friend on an award-winning book? It was an immense privilege to translate the book. It's also an extremely hard book because it has so many thoughts and beautiful images in it, but it's also written in this poetic language. So there's so much that you want to could keep in and and allow to be in the English version that it was um, it was always just a almost a battle. What 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 could I? What, how much could I get into the English? How how little could I lose in the process? And I, I think there was something, so I'm really relieved actually that the, um, the book has been recognized, that it's found its readers in Anglophone countries, because um, I hope that's testament to the, to the process of translating with Maria and trying to, to, trying to retain as much as possible in the book. Mm -hmm. And um, you, Maria, you speak English. I mean, you both are close friends. And so I wonder, you know, what kind of a process in that sense was it? I mean, were you involved? Uh, were you, you know, sometimes maybe giving some edits and then were you, you know, you're both poets as well. So that's interesting. That's an interesting layer too. So tell us about the process. Well, it was, uh, it was, a, and a, in a way it still is an ongoing process of conversation because it didn't start at the point where Sasha <clears throat> actually started translating the book. We were talking about, about the book and about everything, and we keep talking on and on. And so it was an easy thing to be discussing some, well, some tiny intricate uh, things uh, uh, about the translation, as well as all the other things. And uh, in a way, I am thinking of this book as uh, an outcome 
one more outcome of this conversation we had and we're still having. It is a lucky to have this, but the conversation is the one that really means something. Mm -hmm. And Maria, I really, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you answered this question many times, but I'm really curious why you wanted to write this book, because we all lose relatives and we all have families that, you know, that are full of people who don't really want to be noticed. And then, you know, wh what was it the moment where you were like, okay, I have to write this book? I mean, you said in an interview that you wanted to please the dead. So in that sense, it's really interesting. Tell us what does it mean? And uh, why were you motivated to write this book? Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, I can't remember uh, the time in my younger years or in my childhood years when I didn't have this notion of the necessity of writing this book. There was no time uh, completely free of this necessity. And, uh, um, you know, I've uh, started writing it for the first time, and uh, it is a kind of a family joke, but still I have this school notebook that I've started writing in when I was 10 years old uh, with the first drafts of what had later uh, become in memory of memory. Uh, just a few pages, four or five. But some of the stories that are inhibiting in memory of memory are already there. So I was, I always knew that I am going to write this book. And I suppose that, again, it's an outcome of something bigger. Because when you're having four or five generations of people who were moving through the historical process, whether it's catastrophes, staying voluntarily silent. I guess this burden of silence, it just has to be released. And uh, I always knew that I'm going, well, at least to try mm -hmm. helping them, making their stories more visible and uh, creating a space where they could be told in complete safety. And that is also Maria, important. this is interesting, and I want to interrupt you here. Is it because you thought that your family's story was actually more interesting than the others? Or were you just thinking that stories are in general, you know, you know they need to be told and they're usually interesting? Uh -huh. that's, uh, that, that, that's very interesting. And uh, this question, it kind of gets under the core to the to the their heart of my book because uh, my, the main obstacle and the main challenge of writing the whole thing was dealing with something that, that is hard to, to avoid and hard to face. My uh, relatives were uh, absolutely ordinary people, no special uh, interesting uh, things, nothing to place them into this category of interesting that would make them somehow privileged. But I wanted to find a way of writing about the people who are usually, basically, considered to be interesting, finding a way to tell their stories so they would become interesting, but in a different way not because they did or thought something extraordinary, but the very quality of their ordinariness is something that makes them so dear to my heart. And there are stories so amazing to be conveying. Wow, it's lovely. It's lovely to hear it from you. And um, uh, as for one last question, Sasha, I want to turn to you. Uh, you know, Probably one of the X factors about this book is that it doesn't really submit to one particular category as we, you know, as we just talked about. So was it scary for you as a translator in the beginning, you know, when you're, uh, you know, faced with this book that was, as far as I know, treated as a space, you know, as a, as a space to be curated rather than a story to be just written, you know. So in that sense, tell us, uh, was it a bit of an intimidating task? 
Well, it was quite exhilarating, really. And I think I didn't think about it as being one genre or another genre. I simply tried to follow the voice because it, had, it has a very, very clear, distinctive voice. And if, if I followed that voice, then um, it, was, it, it was possible to translate. And as for the, the sense of genres coming together, I find that I find that incredibly refreshing. Um, I said exhilarating because um, it shakes up all the, the 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 norms, all the ideas we have about literature and what it should do. And Maria talked really beautifully about the book and how it remembers ordinary people. Although the book is very specific in some ways to the experience of people in Soviet Russia and 19th century Russia, the actual ideology, I suppose, of the book is incredibly universal about the ethics of remembering and the ethics of nostalgia. All right. Well, there's a lot more to talk about the book, but unfortunately, this is all the time we have. It was lovely having you both. Thanks a lot and good luck. The coronavirus pandemic is still raging in Germany. Most public events have been cancelled and shops have been closed. But that didn't stop Berlin's leading contemporary art event from putting on a show. The 17th edition of Gallery Weekend Berlin brought 49 galleries together. Visitors were required to make appointments and provide a negative rapid antigen test. Despite the precautions, one artist felt upbeat about the event. We need like to show work like to exist, you know, like that's a basic thing. And like for like sculpture like me, like sculpture artists, like internet can't give so much. And the prestige of the show was maintained, according to this gallery owner, Andre Schletrium. Yeah, the gallery. Week. The gallery weekend has long been the most important date of the year to Berlin. Up until now, most of the galleries have moved online. They've used everything from virtual reality to live online tours to connect with buyers and enthusiasts. But Schletrium says digital can never replace physical meetings. I would be quite skeptical about an online-only show. I don't believe in an online digital format for art. Of course, it could be an addition to everything. But a gallery is a social place where people meet. And Gallery Weekend is about that. Gallery Weekend Berlin gave a glimpse of what it was like to host a pre-pandemic show and some galleries are trying to hold on to that feeling. While the event was only three days, many artists will be holding their exhibition for up to six weeks. Emily Blunt describes her latest romantic comedy as poetic and unique. But film critics have other opinions about it. Nursen Atutar has more about Wild Mountain Time. If my true love Wild Mountain Time. It's about two Irish farmers and their will-they-won't-they they love story. Though film critics describe it as a competition of which actor makes the worst Irish accent. I don't see a clear path. From where to where? From me to you. This pastoral setting has Rosemary and Anthony bicker their way into marriage. Even though it's not receiving much love from reviewers, actor Emily Blunt thinks it's a perfect family film. And with the prospect of movie theatres reopening, one that could see box office success. And so the fact that you could potentially sort of either go to the theatres or, or cosy up on a couch with your family and watch this film, which is so about that and where you're from and what you draw your character from is usually, you know, where you were born and the land that you live on. And I think there's something very universal about it, even though it's this fairy tale about Ireland, there's something a lot of us can connect to. Never mind. If it comes to that, I'll freeze my eggs. 
Rosemary had been in love with Anthony since she was little. And while she's tried to court him, he's tied up with family drama. It's not normal. I don't care. It's an adaptation of the American playwright and director Joan Patrick Shandy's Broadway drama Outside Malinga. The film pays special attention to the Irish countryside. And it made actor Jamie Dornan feel so much at home, it's a reason he took to part. Me! That's what's got him worked up! I don't understand you, Pete. I th for, for me, like, you know, I'm from Ireland, I'm from the north of Ireland, and, 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 and I get a very, you know, I live in England now, I have done for uh, 19 years, but, um, no, I I, so I have the most insane um, emotion uh, that comes over me when uh, I'm on an airplane that's about to land in Belfast. Uh, there's nothing like home, you know, it, it, I think for everyone that will always um, uh, have an effect on them like that, you know, and um, uh, and I, I care so much about where I'm from and I, and I love it. So um, yeah, it definitely res resonates with me that. Yeah. Welcome to Ireland. Once upon a time. So. For Dornan, the film with its stereotypical family fights and green landscape creates a homey feeling. My son Anthony asked his lonely question at the start. But if you're able to go to the theatre, Wild Mountain Time might just make you want to get back to your own home. There's these green fields, and there's us. Whatever that is, it holds me here. Vladimir Vinogrado is an engineer currently working as a marketer for a pharmaceutical company. However, his true passion is collecting old pianos and exhibiting his gems to visitors on weekends. These 15 pianos are very different in shape, design and type of construction. They are square and triangular, cabinet and grand concert pianos made in Russia, France and Germany. But Vladimir Vinogradov put it all together for his private collection. It's called the Family of Pianos, and they're located in a wooden house in the village of Eganovo near Moscow. Vinogradov says pianos made before the Russian Revolution even surpassed the quality of top brands such as Steinway. And he adds that while pianos are a part of Russia's history, they aren't so well known yet. I've always been interested in the history of Russia. It's such a piece of history that few people know about, and I'm really keen to tell people about it. Some pieces in the collection date back to the 18th and 19th century. Just like this richly inlaid piano, over 150 years old, it was produced by the French company Pleyel and decorated with elaborate motifs. And although Vinogradov can't even play a simple melody on any of his instruments, he allows visitors to play. This is a piece of art. I can't even call it an instrument because we can listen to the story behind it and feel how it sounded during the times of Beethoven and even play, or rather try to play, the Moonlight Sonata, and that means a lot. And it means a lot to Vinogradov because experiencing the sound of the past and sharing his knowledge about pianos is more important than anything. Comedy icon Buster Keaton's 1921 classic The Goat is celebrating its 100th anniversary. And to mark the milestone, we open up the movie almanac to look back on this era of silent films with the man known as the Great Stone Face. In Buster Keaton's The Goat, the comedy stems from a case of mistaken identity. Police mistake Keaton for a criminal, and to avoid arrest, he goes on the run. This 1921 production was co-directed by Keaton and Malcolm St. Clair who also directed Laurel and Hardy comedies. According to reviews, The Goat is one of the silent star's best films from his early period. 
and critics say Keaton's energetic performance is in top form. Buster Keaton began his film career alongside controversial comedian Roscoe Arbuckle. According to Keaton himself, he rather quickly became Arbuckle's main gag department. Soon after that, he started directing and starring in films produced under the banner Buster Keaton Productions. It was his on-screen persona that distinguished Keaton from his peers. Most comedians, especially in the silent days, relied on facial expressions. Film historians note that when filmed in close-ups, this added to the laughter of audiences the most. However, Keaton defied this Hollywood rule. His cinematic style was based on deadpan reactions to funny situations. He had a sad, almost passionless demeanor, and he not only earned the nickname Stoneface, but also became one of the most bankable stars in Hollywood. Keaton's main competition at the time was Charlie Chaplin. In contrast to Keaton, Chaplin based his comedy on high emotion to win over the audience. But critic-turned-filmmaker Peter Bogdanovich, who also directed The Great Buster documentary, says he prefers Keaton's comedy to Chaplin's. According to Bogdanovich, Chaplin's work feels outdated due to its sentimentality. Other Keaton fans include creatives from all walks of life. Mel Brooks says he learned a lot about filmmaking from Keaton and Salvador Dali called Keaton's comedy philosophy pure poetry, a poetry that could be heard out loud even in silent films. Jason Statham is one of the biggest action stars of our day, and he owes a big part of that fame to director Guy Ritchie. They ended up making three movies together, and now, after 16 years, they're back with a fourth one. Ladies and gentlemen, we have a new addition, H. Wrath of Man is about the mysterious H. A cash truck company hires him after being hit by a series of deadly robberies. Some idea, yeah. We it soon turns out H, played by Jason Statham, is not just a security guard, but a skilled marksman, and he took the job to hunt down the people behind his son's murder. Guy Ritchie directed the film. He says he enjoyed teaming up with Statham once again on an action thriller. I thought this would be the perfect story for Jason and I to be reunited on. Um, it's not funny, this film. It's serious and the theme is serious and it's very violent and very aggressive but I thought it'd be the perfect film for the perfect role for Jason. Sorry pal. And fortunately Statham agreed. He called me up about this this idea that he had it was a very short pitch uh, and I liked the premise and I was you know quick to say yes. Probably quicker than Richie when he cast Statham in his 1998 movie Lock, stock and two smoking barrels. As the actor once explained, I'll always be grateful to Guy Ritchie because I was selling perfume and jewellery on the street and he offered me that part and changed my life. They ended up making two more movies together. Snatch. Was a gun doing your trousers? Rule one of any game or con. And Revolver. Fast forward 16 years later and now we have Wrath of Man. The only difference is we're a little older and a little chubbier. <laughs> uh, I think we've uh, <laughs> we've had our good lives. Uh, we've both been on a very sort of different sort of journey, but in sort of parallel in our own way. You know, he's been making films. I've been making films. We keep, you know, we keep a social connection. We get along. We share, you know, some common things that we like. We we have a passion for martial arts. We have a lot of, you know, similar taste in films. And, and if you do, then why not make a movie together? Wrath of Man has received mixed reviews so far, but
But as Richie and Statham's film collaborations have all gained cult followings in the past, one could expect the same with their latest endeavor. You know what I wish you could do in 20 years? It's too early to tell if that will happen, but it seems like the pair's long-time partnership is going strong. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Milf Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.